Good morning. So good to see you all this morning. I'm Reverend Christy Hollifield. <laughs> I got your attention now, didn't I? I'm Reverend Christy Hollifield, and I'm one of the ministers here at First Baptist Waynesville, and we welcome each and every one of you this morning to First Baptist. Um, we love to have you all this morning. Our mission statement is to embody Christ. It is to love all people and introduce them to the God that we love. And we are thrilled for you as guests here this morning. Inside of our bulletin on the third, on the top of the third page, you will find a QR code. If you are a visitor with us, if you wouldn't mind to snap a picture of that QR code and fill out information about yourself. If you prefer, we also have information cards located at our tithe boxes um, at the back of the sanctuary there, and then one beside each of these doors up here. We would love to learn more about you and introduce you to the church and ways to um, become involved. This morning, we will continue our sermon series, When the Dark Spirit Comes, and we will be focusing on anxiety this morning. We will be looking at Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25 in that discussion. After our worship, if you will pass through these doors here, either on either side, head across the hall to our Connections Coffee House. We have um, hot tea and hot coffee. It's a wonderful time of fellowship before we head over to our small groups. If you're not involved in a small group but would like to learn more about the different small groups, you're welcome to ask us. We'll be happy to direct you. But there's also a listing of all the small groups on the bulletin board as you head into Connections Coffee House. So this morning, um, I would like to, for us, as we are preparing for our worship this morning, as we are um, connecting and settling ourselves and connecting with God, um, I would like for us to listen to a poem. I have a poem that I would like to read to you as part of our prayer. So if you guys will now join me in prayer, this is a poem for equilibrium, um, a poem for balance in our lives. Like the joy of the sea coming home to shore, may the relief of laughter rinse through your soul. As the wind loves to call things to dance, may your gravity be lightened by grace. Like the dignity of the moonlight restoring the earth, may your thoughts incline with reverence and respect. As the water takes whatever shape it is in, so free may you be about what you become. As silence smiles on the other side of what is said, may your sense of irony bring perspective. As time remains free of all that it frames, may your mind stay clear of all that it names. May your prayer of listening deepen enough to hear the depths of laughter of God. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you enlighten us in your word today. We all have huge senses of feelings and emotions that sometimes we do not quite know how to navigate. Give us wisdom and knowledge as to how to do so. Thank you for this beautiful day and this time to be together with you and your word and worshiping you. We ask these things in your heavenly name. Amen. And in worship with us. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7 read, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That with thanksgiving part is really important because when you're counting your blessings, when you're not concentrating on the, concentrating on the what ifs and the if onlys and you're thinking about what you already have, um, it's really hard to be worried about anything when you're praising God.
may be seated. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your care and your guidance. Help us to understand that you are always with us and always reachable by prayer. Teach us to look to you for direction, knowing that your righteous right hand will hold us and keep us safe. Thank you for always being with us from the wings of dawn to the far side of the sea. In Jesus' name, amen. can come up for children's sermon. Good morning, my friends. So good to see you this morning. So last week we started talking about our feelings and how we have all sorts of feelings that can kind of overwhelm us sometimes. And sometimes we need to talk about those feelings. Last week we talked about depression or this really deep sadness that comes to us sometimes and about how God is always there for us to talk to, but how he also provides us other ways of getting better. Might be our doctor, it might be medicine, it could be all sorts of things. Well, today we're gonna be talking about anxiety. And anxiety is kind of like a mixture of fear and worry and all of those things kind of rolled up together. And sometimes we can have those feelings when we've got a big project coming up at school or we got to do something we've never done before. And it's important that we listen to what those feelings are telling us. So in our story this morning, Jesus is out in the water on this boat. He and his disciples have set sail. And all of a sudden, this huge storm comes up and the waves are hitting against the the boat and it's rocking back and forth and they're all getting afraid. They have a lot of fear, don't they? Would you be afraid if you were out on a boat and it was tossing and turning and going everywhere? Yeah, it would be kind of scary sort of thing. Well, they come to Jesus. Jesus is in the belly of the boat, sleeping And they're wondering, how is he able to sleep through this? What's going on? How can he do that? And then they go down and they get him and they bring him up. And as soon as he comes up, he calms the storm. He calms the waves. And he says to them, why are you afraid? Sometimes we can have storms like that in our lives where we're just afraid of things. And knowing that God is there for us to talk to and to call upon is so important. And to know that we have people around us that we can talk to and share that information with and those feelings with is so important as well. And there's not a feeling that is ever crazy in Jesus's eyes. 
There is nothing, there's not a crazy question, and it's not ever unusual for us to ever need to talk to him about those things. He wants us to. So I have a little bit of a story for you this morning, or a little bit of a poem, to remind us about how we can come to God and talk to him. God is a savior. When we are about to fall, when we are sad or frightened, when we need someone to take our hand, to comfort us, to reassure us, God wants to do that for us. Sometimes this is hard to believe, but if there is still so much evil, death, and grief in our world, it's only because God has not had the last word yet. Here is a picture, and that picture is kind of like those storms that we were talking about earlier, isn't it? And how the lighthouse is God. He shows us direction. He helps us through it. All right, let's pray, my friends. Father God, we thank you so much for being that still certain presence in our lives. We ask your Holy Spirit to remind us, to urge us, to talk to you, to share with you, to depend upon you, to ask questions, to listen to the answers, and to most importantly, feel your presence through it all. Thank you for being that still place of peace and comfort. Amen. Tracy, up here today, as you know, I don't have my pillow and sling on today, so that's, yay. Good progress. Uh, now if I can just lose the five or six pounds that I put on since I had it. And uh, if I'm still a little slow to shake your hand, remember, um, when I was a boy, I used to like to watch championship wrestling on the afternoons, and one of my heroes was Dory Funk Sr., and Dory Funk Sr. said if he punched you with, your left, with his left hand, it was the hospital. If he punched you with your right, it was the funeral home. So for me, it's more like a love tap and a wave, so that's all I got. So anyway, appreciate your prayers, and it's great to be free of that thing, and I'm getting a good doctor's report, and so again, thank you for... Uh, for your concern, and, a, and, and again, a praise for progress. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you, God, for all that you brought to our lives. And Lord, we pray you be with us as we come and worship together this morning. Help us to feel your presence. Help us, God, to seek you with all we are. And we pray that you'd help us in the midst of our cares and anxieties. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. And our text today comes from verses eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Luke 8, 22 to 25. There it's written. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Today we are continuing in our worship unit on mental health. The title of it is, When the Dark Spirit Comes, the Church and Mental Health. And in this unit, we're thinking about, about what the scriptures say about mental health and about spiritual resources and about what we have as a church that we can, that we can minister to each other and to our community on this very important topic. And we've talked about the fact that, that we're in a, a crisis of mental health in our country today. 
And so it's important for us as God's people to be thinking about it and to be ministering in the, the middle of it all. Today we're going to uh, continue in this unit. Last week we talked about depression. And this week we're going to think about fear, about anxiety. And this is an image which I, I found that I think captures a lot of what we can feel when we're very anxious. We're kind of balled up and, and there's this, this hovering anxiety, this hovering worry and difficulty over us. We need a certain amount of anxiety to be healthy. God put this in us, I think, to help protect us. I... I used to like to watch Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. And who would have thought with all the dangerous beasts he dealt with, cobras and crocodiles, that it would be a stingray which would take his life. But I remember on one show, he and a team of about eight or ten were wrestling with this giant crocodile. And Irwin and about five of them were on top of this crocodile trying to get duct tape around its, uh, around its jaws and tied up with rope. And I remember in, in a moment when they were all on this crocodile hearing Irwin say, don't lose the fear. And what I think he meant by that was don't, don't be lulled into a false sense of security in dealing with this creature. Don't forget what this creature is. Because if you forget what this creature is, then somebody's going to get hurt or killed. So it's important that we be aware of that. It's important that we have a certain amount of fear, respect, or anxiety. That's important for our safety and our survival. But anxiety becomes unhealthy when it interferes with your ability to function, when it gets in the way of living your life, where you can't... Uh, can't sometimes work, you can't enjoy social life, you can't get out, uh, you can't interact with people very well, all because of the anxiety you have. Anxiety disorders are the most common forms of mental illness in our country today. In our country, about 40 million adults aged 18 or older have some kind of anxiety disorder. That's nearly 20% of people 18 and older in our country have some kind of anxiety disorder. The number is even higher among adolescents. About 32% of adolescents between 13 and 18 years old deal with some kind of, of, of major anxiety disorder. And also, as we'll see, there's a lot of overlap in anxiety as a lot of people suffer other things with it, like physical problems and are prone to other kinds of problems. Teenagers who are untreated for their anxiety disorders are at higher risk of performing poorly in school, of getting into drugs, getting into other kinds of, of trouble. So it's an important problem among them. But anxiety disorders are not limited to the young. They're common among older people, too. Older people suffer from uh, oftentimes what they call generalized anxiety disorder. And sometimes that comes because of a traumatic event, a traumatic illness, or fear of illness, or something like that. They say that, and I, and I know that anxiety disorders are highly treatable. In other words, you can get good help of it, for it, but only about 40% of people who need treatment actually end up getting it. And there are many types of anxiety disorders. There's generalized anxiety disorder, there's panic disorder, there's specific phobias, uh, and there's stress-produced anxiety, panic attacks, all other kinds of things that we can uh, name that are all too common in our society. And oftentimes they go together with physical illness. Others accompany other disorders like anxiety and depression often go together. And other types of things, uh, ADHD goes with anxiety disorders. How do people get them? Well, how do people 
get in or have that anxiety disorders, what leads them into it? Well, it's complicated. There are complicated risk factors for it. Sometimes it's your genetics. Uh, anxiety disorders are often passed down. Sometimes it's your own body chemistry. Sometimes it's personality, life events. All these things together create these anxiety disorders. So today we're going to talk about what the scriptures say and how the church can minister in this context of anxiety. And we're going to see that God brings us hope in dealing with anxiety. Jesus spent much of his ministry around this large body of water, a freshwater lake, which the Bible often calls the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't actually a sea. It was just, it's a very large lake, and it's fed mainly by the Jordan River. But it's so big, it looks like a sea when you're standing on the shore. So Jesus and his disciples ministered a lot around that sea, which Part of, which, part of which touched uh, the area of Galilee, where Jesus mainly ministered. And in Luke 3.22, it says that on one occasion, Jesus proposed that he and his disciples sail to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Again, it's also called the Lake of Gennesaret. It's called the Sea of Tiberias. All these are names for the same body of water. So Jesus proposes they do that, and so... They set off sailing across this body of water. We seems like they're on their way, and they would eventually land in the, in the area of the Gerasenes, where they would meet the Gerasene uh, demoniac. So that was where they were going. So they're on this sea, and in those days, they didn't have the weather channel or anything like that. So uh, you had experienced, uh, or people experienced on that lake, and in uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they were all fishermen. They'd all been out on that lake. They knew what it was like. So uh, those who went across the lake, these experienced men, would try to read the sky and figure out if the weather was going to be okay. And apparently they thought it was going to be okay on this trip, but it turned out not to be. Well, as the story unfolds, they are going across the Sea of Galilee on this uh, fishing boat and Jesus falls asleep which sounds appropriate you know you're out there on the water kind of gently rocking along there's the there's the the, the wind and the sails you know the quiet the coolness of the, now don't take your mid-morning nap as we go through this so so you know it sounds good for a nap and the boat they were in here's an actual uh They've actually found, archaeologists have found sort of the keel of, of what those fishing boats were like on the Sea of Galilee. And that's the, the, the kind of keel and part of the hull of one. This is a replica of the size of this. It's not like a family uh, pleasure boat and not quite a ship. It's kind of in between. And this is the kind of, uh, of boat they were on. So Jesus falls asleep, but during that time... Uh, a dangerous squall comes on them, which can happen out on that sea. A sudden storm hits, high winds, high, wa high waves. And suddenly out in this storm, things become very dicey for the disciples. And if you've ever been on a large body of water and experienced something like this, you know how scary it can be. You're out there, you're away from land, you're being pitched back and forth, and, uh, and things look really bad. So that's what happened to the disciples. And so the disciples struggled to try to keep the boat afloat. I'm sure they were bailing water, but they felt that the boat was going to be swamped and that they were all going to drown. But Jesus kept on sleeping. So finally, in verse 24, it says the disciples wake, awaken Jesus and hear their words. He, they say, Master, Master, we're going to drown. You catch the urgency. You know, they, they just don't say Master once, they say it twice. Wake up. We're in peril. We're about to lose our lives. Do something that we don't know 
exactly what they thought Jesus might do. I don't think they expected him to do what he did. Uh, But they're scared. They're panicked. They don't know what's going to happen. So then Jesus does wake up. And he apparently stands up in the boat. And in the original language, he says literally, quiet, cut it out, silence, be still. And the storm calmed. The wind and the waves receded and things became quiet once again. And after that, Jesus rebukes his disciples. He says, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Don't you know who you have with you? Don't you know who's with you in the midst of this peril and storm? The disciples apparently didn't respond to him, but they say in fear, notice here this, in fear and amazement. Now, before they were scared of the storm, now they're scared of Jesus. In fear and amazement, They say, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Who is this guy? What kind of power does he have? As I was praying about this sermon today and thinking about it, to me, it it felt that this story on this large lake in the storm presents a great dramatic picture of anxiety. What is it? What is it like? What's the feeling of anxiety? The feeling of being in this little boat, tossed about in the storm, uncertain of what's going to happen, and Jesus asleep in the boat. That's what it can feel. You don't know what's going to happen. You're, you're, You're your, your life, your livelihood, whatever is at stake, and you're anxious. You don't know what's going to, going to happen. So, again, Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, and then he rebuked his disciples for their lack of faith. I'll have to say that sometimes in my own life, my anxiety comes from my own lack of faith, you know, really believing that Jesus is going to deliver and going to help. To confess, some of it comes from my experience of disaster early in my life. Others others experienced greater disaster, but my parents divorced when I was five years old. And I, I prayed that God would bring them back together, and he didn't. And at the time, I kind of felt like God had rank, uh, kind of yanked the rug out from under me. And it it, it sort of instilled in me this this wonder or this um, doubt that maybe God was not going to deliver. Now, today I know that God was not responsible for my parents' divorce. And I also know that God is not in the business of changing people's feelings. But I also know that it hurt and it was difficult. And it it threw off my equilibrium and my faith. So I also know at the same time that when I get anxious, I'm saying to God, God, I really don't trust you. I don't believe you're going to bring me through this. Sometimes you're like me and you say, God, I know you delivered me all those other times, but I don't know about this time. Are you going to be with me this time? Are you going to deliver me through this crisis? Now, the scriptures provide great encouragement for those who are fearful and anxious. Most of us know well the the 23rd Psalm. And when you look at that Psalm and the images involved, to me you see that it was born out of fear and anxiety. It was born out of worry and seeking God for help and support. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me everything I need. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by the quiet waters. He restores My soul, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table 
before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, and I'll live in your house forever. What great comfort that is, and that's comforted believers for thousands of years in that 23rd Psalm. There's so many other great ones uh, in, in, in the New Testament as well. Uh, a common favorite of many Christ followers is Romans chapter 8, particularly verses 18 to 39. My favorite part of that is beginning in verse 37 of Romans 8, where it's written, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What greater assurance could there be? Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us from his presence and his help and his power. It also helps me in, in dealing with anxiety to, to remember practical things. Remember Jesus said, who of you by worrying can add a minute to your life? Uh, years ago, I watched the movie um, Bridge of Spies. In the movie, uh, Tom Hanks uh, plays a lawyer who's uh, retained to, to uh, represent uh, a Russian spy. Uh, and, and, and this Russian spy is, 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 is in deep trouble. And Tom Hanks is talking to him, counseling him, and he says to him, he says, don't you know that you could spend the rest of your life in prison? Aren't you worried that you could be put to death for this? Aren't you worried about this and that? And then the Russian says, would it help? So in my worries, I, I come back to that thing. Is my worrying helping? Is there anything positive being ac accomplished by this anxiety? And the answer is no. It, 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 if you can't prepare, if you can't change anything, if it is what it is, then there's nothing you could do. Most people can find peace from anxiety through spiritual resources, through the scriptures, through prayer, through the peace that passes all understanding that God can give. But there are many people who have significant anxiety disorders, and those spiritual resources by themselves are not enough to bring healing and help. One thing that we need to remember is, as we're talking about this, the close connection between mental and physical health. A problem we have as Western people is that we're strongly influenced by Greek culture. And in Greek culture, the Greeks believed that you're a body with a soul. In other words, body and soul are separate. They believed that you had an eternal pre-existence as, as a spiritual being, and you came down and, and you have now existence in a body, and then you're going to go on and have a spiritual existence in eternity, disembodied. Body and soul are separate. And that led them in all kinds of different directions philosophically. And we're influenced by that. We tend to think in those terms. We're bodies with souls. And that those are separate. Separate areas. And even sometimes medical science and science itself has tended to look at them as separate Entities, not look at the spiritual side. But that Greek view is not biblical. That's not how the Bible sees us. We see that very strongly in, in Genesis 2 7, where it describes how God created Adam. What does it say? It says, God took the, the dirt, the dust of the ground, and breathed into it his spirit, and the, the, this, this dust and dirt became a living being. So, in the Hebrew view, you're, you're not a body with a soul, you're a body-soul. Both are mixed up with each other. That's why in the Bible, the hope for eternal life is not being a disembodied spirit in heaven. The hope for eternal life is in a resurrected body, in a real body, living in eternity. So, body and soul are mixed together. And so, you ask, what does this have to do with anxiety, mental health, and all that? Part of it is that anxiety affects your physical health and your physical health 
influences your, your, your anxiety. All of those work together. Life experience, genetics, all these things come together for it. So what do you do if you are suffering from anxiety? And, and it's really severe and it's, it's hampering your ability to function in life. As we said last week with depression, you can start with your personal physician. Say, look, I, I'm dealing with this. I'm suffering with this. I need help with this. And if your personal physician can't help, uh, he or she can point you in the right direction. Secondly, build your spiritual resources. Again, sometimes, or, or for a number of people, that's not enough, but it's still important. It still needs to be there. You need those spiritual resources in addition to any medication or anything you, you may take or any other treatment. So build your spiritual resources. Pray, study the scriptures, come to worship, worship on your own, be part of a small group here at church. Do all those things to help you build up your spiritual resources in order to deal with your anxiety. This may be the hard one. Reach out to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That can be hard. That's because sometimes at church, we feel like we got to have the happy face on. You know, Jesus is, is overcoming all, all trouble in me. I'm doing great. How about you? Uh, I'm doing great too. Well, probably neither one of you are doing real great. So, so sometimes, and, and it takes risk to be vulnerable to other people. To say, I'm, it shouldn't be this way in the body of Christ, but many times it is. To take the risk of being vulnerable and saying, I'm having this issue. I'm dealing with this problem. And I need your prayers. And I need your help. So what you will probably find are lots of other people who are going through the same thing. You know, they are struggling with anxiety and problems. The next question is, what can our church do? What can we do as a congregation to help people dealing with anxiety? Well, one, know that we can make a real difference in the lives of people suffering from anxiety. We can make a real difference. We're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the gospel. We have spiritual resources. We've got the Holy Spirit. We have all these traditions and, and, and ways of dealing with anxiety spiritually. So, so we can make a real difference in reaching out to others in love. Don't think that we can't do anything. We can. We can help people. We can minister in the midst of this. Second, pray for them and be available to them. Sometimes uh, people may share stuff with us and we say, I don't want to hear that. You know, I, do, I don't want to be brought down myself. And, and that's a very natural human response. But pray for those suffering. And I, I guarantee you there are people all around you suffering with this. Pray for those people who are dealing with that and be available to them. Next, proclaim and hold to the biblical view of the body and soul and encourage, both, encourage people to involve both in dealing with anxiety because they're going to affect both. And say, you're, you're not just a, uh, your soul in there is not just in isolation. It's part of your body and, and vice versa. So be aware that sometimes healing has to come to both and both must be ministered to. And then... Oppose the stigma attached to all mental illness, but you know, to this one as well. That if you're suffering from anxiety, you're not, in, you're not walking in the Spirit, you're not in the Lord, you're not reading the Scriptures like you should, you're not coming to church like you should, whatever. Oppose that stigma and say, that's not right. This is an illness and it needs prayer and treatment. And then finally, connect them to good resources for help. We have community resources. We've, I think we've listed some of those in your bulletin. Look for those community resources in the church. We can connect people to them. This morning, if you're suffering from anxiety, please know that Jesus is not just sleeping in the boat. That he is there. He's with you. He's willing to help. Let him Calm your spirit by his power and his spirit and by good professional help who can enable you to overcome your struggle. Let's pray. As we pray, the choir is going to be coming forward to 
uh, prepare for our next part of our worship service. And I ask you to look in your heart and life and your relationship with God. Uh, If you don't know the Lord Jesus, he is the key to overcoming everything. And he is the key foundation. And if you've never followed Christ, we invite you to do that today, to make him your Lord and Savior. I'll be standing here at the front and we'll be glad to receive you and share with you how you can become a Christ follower. You may have another decision or commitment to make, and we invite you to come forward as well. You may want to come front and kneel and pray. But whatever God is leading you to do, we invite you to respond as the Spirit touches your heart this morning. Dear Lord, sometimes we do get afraid, and sometimes our anxieties seem to get the upper hand in our lives. And Lord, I know too that some are suffering from anxiety that that really needs professional help and healing. And I pray, God, that we would be a help to them and be able to point them to good help and that they would find it. And that they could live lives of peace, of joy, and of engagement in healthy ways with other people. Father, we do have many fears in our Fears and doubts often multiply inside us. Help us in those times to lean on you and to remember the one who can calm the wind and the waves and bring us to your peace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and you respond as God leads you this morning. Standing as we sing hymn 533, He Lives.
We're privileged to have with us today IMB missionaries, uh, Kevin and Susie Rogers. And so they're going to come and share with us at this time. So thank you. We're so glad you guys are here. And let's show them our love and welcome them here today. Good morning. It's so good to be with you again. I think we came about three years ago. Like um, your pastor said, we are Kevin and Susie Rogers, and we have served with the International Mission Board for the last 25 years, um, a long time. We were in Zambia for 19 years, and then we have been in Kenya for the last six years. 
Um, we have three children and two grandchildren, and they are just so precious. And we are enjoying spending time with them as we are here in the States currently on our furlough or stateside assignment. We came in November and will be here until June um, 12th is the day that we fly out. And um, we came at this time and stayed a little bit longer than usual because our daughter is graduating from North Greenville University and getting married the week after that. So we have a lot coming up in the last few weeks, in the next couple of weeks. And so I think I'm going to ask Kevin now to share about the work that we do in Kenya. So in 25 years, we've done a lot of things, been a lot of places, and, um, and been involved in many ministries. And, um, but something that we have seen is a lot of change over that time. Um, something that a lot of people don't realize is the world actually turned upside down in 2018. People don't realize that, but the center of Christianity is now in Africa. Then 2018 was the year when there were more churches and more Christians in Africa than on any other continent on the planet, including right here in North America. I'm sure you've noticed around you culture changes and things have declined, but in Africa, uh, Africa's on the rise. And, um, and God is moving. And so many people would say, well, then, uh, missionary, why are you still there? <laughs> um, and, and I get that point. Now, there's still plenty of lostness in Africa, still plenty of zero to one places where we have church planters coming. But we think that the, the rise of Africa and the African church is significant because we believe now it's their time to stop being the receivers of missionaries and become the senders of missionaries. Uh, one of the verses that I, I speak about a lot is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. And, um, and I, I challenge you with that and myself and even our African brothers and sisters, not just to say, what is it that, that after 178 years of gospel witness with the International Mission Board, 150 years actually in sub-Saharan Africa, now what is it time for the African church to begin to do? So we, we lead a team called the Outbound Team, and the focus of our work is actually to work with the African church to help African churches become healthy because our vision, our ultimate vision is for African churches to send African missionaries to the ends of the earth. So we feel like that even though, yes, we're working with, in a place where Christianity is on the rise, it's even more imperative that we stay the course and continue to help them to develop their own mission sending organization, their own mission sending effort because we believe that the beautiful feet that are going to take the worldwide church across the finish line of the Great Commission, we believe those are African feet. And uh, so we spend a lot of time giving pedicures. We, we love those feet. We're, we're washing those feet. We're training those feet, serving those feet, trying to empower and equip those people to go and to do around the world what we've been doing and what you've been doing through people that you send. And what you've been doing is you pray and give and go. So we thank the Lord for your, your participation in our ministry, just the way you pray for us, support us, and are so faithful to encourage us. And we're trying to pass that on to others uh, in other places around the world who are also sending and going. And um, because this is a team effort, it's not really about the center anymore. It's more about going from everywhere to everywhere. And, um, and so that's a, a new day, and we're thankful for what God is doing in the world and thankful for your participation in that. Um, as you go and have um, coffee right there, as, as you enter into that room, into the gym, there is a t on the table um, our new prayer cards. We would love for you to get one of those. It's a, just an updated picture of us with our contact information. But on the back of the card, there's a QR code, and you can go to that QR code and learn more about our team and the projects that we are working on. We're doing some exciting things. So we would love for you to take a look at that and just really be praying for us. Also, there's a sheet of paper there that you can sign up to receive our ministry updates. I send them out about once every two months. And so we would love for you to be able to get those and hear what we're doing um, with our team and among um, our African brothers and sisters, and then be able to join us in praying for that. Like Kevin said, we just want to thank you for um, your prayers and support over the years, not just for us, but for all IMB missionaries um, that serve around the world. Thank you so much. Now, Allison Lee is going to come and share with us about a local mission opportunity. Hello. 
I am here to invite you to come to a celebration with one of our local mission partners, the Pigeon Community Multicultural Development Center. Now, some of you know a lot of things they do. Um, some of you, it may just be something that you've heard in passing that we talk about at church. The first thing I wanna do is thank all of you for what the church has given to the Pigeon Center so far. Um, February, we had a big dinner, a big fundraiser that we desperately needed, and we were also celebrating Black History Month. And this church did more to support that fundraiser than any other group. And I spent the day there, and I have never felt so proud to be part of a community because there was cobbler after cobbler after cobbler brought in. And then um, I ended up actually meeting people from this church I didn't know as we dipped out car cobbler or served chicken or all the wonderful things we did that day to raise some money to keep that ministry going. Now, some of you may not know a lot about the center. You might have heard that we've done our Easter egg hunt there, so it could be very inclusive. Um, we are really good at that. We've hunted eggs in the snow, we've hunted eggs in the rain, so you know, one day we're actually gonna hunt them in the sunshine, maybe next year. But we've enjoyed the work we do together. The Pigeon Center is housed in the elementary school building that served the African American community from 1957 until 1966. So it's a very important space and it took a lot of work for that space to be leased by the African-American community in Waynesville. Now, we would like to think that since 1966 and integration, all divisions between people have just gone away. And we understand that we are all God's children. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. And so the work is still very, very important. Um, as time went on, the Pigeon Center realized that it would be much more than an African-American center, but it would truly be multicultural because that was what was needed in the community. And the programs have changed over the years to meet the needs. Now, Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 29th, from 2 until 4, we are having a big celebration to celebrate several things. One of them is that that building has been recognized and put on the National Historic Registry, which is really in and of itself a big accomplishment. And we're in the process of planning ways to commemorate and honor and memorialize the people who taught in that building, the students who learned in that building. So it's kind of a then and a now. Because now we, for 20 years, this coming summer is the 20th year of a children's summer program. And um, I know last year our church did like a mini vacation Bible school once a week. Reverend Christie did that and, and led some other folks in being involved. Um, those children from the after school program have come to Kid Create and to some activities that we've created just for them. So it's kind of endless. And if you would come and join us this is not a fundraiser. You just come and enjoy, learn about what we've done, and hopefully um, learn about some things that you might could help us do. But before I go, I do want to read you the actual mission statement of the organization, because I think it tells you a lot about their priorities and why we want to be involved. The mission of the Pigeon Community Multicultural Development Center is to strengthen harmony among the residents of our county and its communities. To achieve this, we help reestablish the long-standing tradition of the community as a family. We foster intentional inclusiveness to create a holistic quality of life. And finally, we recognize and give glory to God as we serve. So I hope you'll join us next week. Now, now Christy has a quick announcement for us. Thank you, Allison. 
So when you head over to Connections Coffee House, there will be a table that will encourage you to create a or write a card for a senior, um, a high school senior student this year. Um, for the past couple of years, uh, Tuscola High School has offered sun Senior Sunset, and they have a special evening for all of the seniors as they are preparing for graduation. And one of the things that all of the seniors uh, are handed is a gold envelope. And inside of this gold envelope are letters of support and encouragement and, and love that um, have been written by family members, close family friends, church community. Unfortunately, not all students have that sort of support and love and environment in their lives. And so one of the missions that we have taken on is to write a few cards and notes to those students who need them the most. Um, so this morning, if you would take just a few moments um, to stop by the table, grab a card and a pen and write just a simple note. Um, we do not have the students' names. We do not have um, important information about them. But if you could just write a note of encouragement. I've given a few samples of things that you might want to think about wording. If you want to, you can look at those and use those. If you have something specifically on your heart and mind that you would love to write, please do that. Um, and then just stick the completed cards in the box that is sitting on the table. Uh, we would really appreciate it, and it would mean so much to those students who um, may not receive a note or two in their golden envelope. Um, I'll be there if you have any questions, but thank you for taking the time to do that for us. A couple very quick announcements. First of all, uh, the 200th Anniversary Committee has free church history books at our exits. They're in red. Pick them up. They're free. we got tons of them. Uh, do that, and we're looking forward to our anniversary coming up this summer. Remember, quarterly business meeting in here at 1215. Uh, that's coming up. And uh, those of you going to the Baptist Joint Committee event this evening, the van will leave at 4.15. So let's now stand, and uh, we will join in singing, The Lord Be With You Till We Meet Again. Grab we may hand. join hands, but please keep this aisle free, clear for our acolytes. Thank you. invite to join us for coffee connections just go straight through the exit doors we're also starting a new young couples uh, Sunday school class check with me if you need directions to that <laughs> 